Okay, I think I'm ready. <laughs> We're coming towards the end of 2020. And it's been a terrific year. We've been talking about that. We've said that a few times. This has been the year where, goodness sakes, quite a few things have really impinged on Islam. We've talked about the problems with the emergence of Islam, the historical problems with the 7th century. But probably the biggest thing that's come down the pike this year has been the Kira'at. These things, these books right up here. These are nine of the 30 that are officially considered to be official by Muslim scholars today. And that infamous interview that we had on June 8th uh, between Muhammad Hijab and Yasser Qadi, we've talked about it over and over again. And all the time that we have talked about it, there has, I've been waiting for someone to come up with some type of rebuttal and uh, with the material that we're coming up with. And the only rebuttal so far has been, Jay, you don't have, know your Arabic. Jay, you don't understand this thing. Jay, this, Jay, that. It's all been ad hominem, ad hominem against me, my person. And I've not really seen anybody that's put any claims. Even Yasser Qadi with his, with his meltdown that happened on November 26th, uh, Thanksgiving morning, didn't really engage with anything that I'd said. He just went to two videos that had nothing really to do with the Kir'at, other than the fact that I was referring to, to at one point, I was referring to the, uh, the, the 29 other Kir'ats that disagreed with the Hafs that were thrown into the Nile and made a big, big, big point of, Jay, how could all the Qur'ans, uh, other Qur'ans in the world fit into the Nile, as if that's what I was saying. In fact, we were making a joke about that very thing. Uh, did they think that because they threw all these high school students, 29 kiddos from the high school students at that, did they think they could destroy all the Qurans? Now, so I've been waiting for a good response and I still haven't found one. But I, what I'm going to do, since we're almost ending the year, I'm going to go back to one that did come down the pike a few days ago from a friend of mine in Africa, from one of his friends uh, who tried to, who did a whole study, I understand, uh, on the Qiraat, trying to answer me and spent much of the time just throwing lots of vitriol at me, much like Yasser Qadi. So I'm not even going to name him because it's not important. I don't think he needs to have any name. I don't deal with anybody that's, that just sits and mocks me. If they're going to mock me, then why engage with him? But I want to go and I want to engage with some of the things that had come out of his uh, meetings and also others that have brought up because I think you all need to be aware of how people are going to respond. And let me just go ahead. I've taken, I think, tw 25 different points that I would like to bring up, 25 different ideas that I'd like to engage with concerning the, the difficulties for Muslims. And I can see why. They, it's difficult for them to respond to the, the different kirats, these different derivations of the Quran nine of which I have here, I, I, I don't know how I would be able to do it in the place. So let's go through some of these that have come up, and I'll be moving them around, I'll be putting them into categories, and I'll try to respond to them as we go. The first thing that comes up, and this is one of the, you'll hear this from a lot of Muslims. Yasser Qadi used to say this all the time, that there are 10 different recognized schools of Kirat. There are 10. And the 10 he's referring to are, are these 10 right here. I'll put this up on the screen so you can see what I'm talking about. Look at this. You can see it there. Can you see on the left side? Look on the left side and look at the green names. These are the readers. Those are the first seven. Those are the ones that Ibn Mujahid chose. So that's Nafi, Ibn Kathir, Abu Amr, Ibn Amir, Asim, Hamzak, Al-Qasai. Those are the seven, the green ones that you see there, chosen by Ibn Mujahid in 936. So you have that in front of you. Now, look below that, and, and now let's go back, and let's go back to the three below that in red. Abu Ja'far and Yaqub al-Yamani and Khalaf. Excuse me for my Arabic. I know a lot of people mock me for my Arabic. I have an accent, and I'm not going to be able to read it as good as Al-Fadi reads, and it would be great if you were here, he could read it for me. But those were chosen by Al-Jazari in 1429. Look at the date, 1429. So we're talking about the 15th century. That is 800 years later that another three were chosen. And you add those... 7 plus 3, the green and the red, and you get 10. And that's the 10 that they're all talking about. And it comes up over and over again. I hear about these 10, about these 7, about the 3, about the 10. These are the 10. The creme de la creme that Yasser Qadi used to talk about. The, the best of the best, he used to say. 
I, I wonder, I'm still sure he still says that today, and he would say that there is not any difference in any words or letters between these ten. Uh, I, and, and yet it's fascinating to me, he's not responded to that. I'd like to know if he still says that. I'd like to know if any of these Muslims still say that, that these ten that we're looking at, the seven green and the three red, uh, are there any differences? So he's, they talk about these ten. That's the first problem. Second thing they go into is that they were approved, and this is what comes up. They said that they were approved by Abu Bakr ibn Mujahid. No, they were not. Only seven were approved by Abu Bakr ibn Mujahid. Uh, the other three, as I've just showed you, you can see it right there, were approved by Al Jazari in 1429, 800 years later. So when Muslims say that, hold them, hammer them on that, and say, stop, you're not, either you don't understand, or you're just being confused, or you're just running it together, and you're not thinking it through. If you're going to talk about the ten, then you've got to choose the first seven and the next three. The first seven and the next three. And they don't do that. They just say ten without thinking about it, without realizing that these ten were finally chosen by al Jazari in 1420. Uh, 1429. The only first seven were chosen in 936, and that in and of itself is a problem when you stop and think about it, because 936, they were chosen 300 years after Muhammad. So these were not chosen by Muhammad. These were not chosen by Uthman. These were not chosen by anybody in the 7th century. They were chosen in the 10th century and the 15th century, 300 years after Muhammad and 800 years after Muhammad. Are you getting that? I'm going to keep dribbling this home, because Muslims won't tell you this. I'm telling you this. So this is hundreds and hundreds of years, 800 years after the fact that these now first three, sorry, first seven and the, the next three. Now notice, I just went through those names. Let's go put it up again. I went through those names. Nafi, Abi Katir, Abu Mir. I'm going to repeat them again. Take a look. Do you see Huff's name there? The Quran that we're using today, this one here, this is Huff's. This is the Quran that everybody used, well, 93% of the Muslim world, or 95% as some say, 95% of the Muslim world uses. Is that in those 10? And see, this is another big lie that Muslims aren't uh, admitting to, including this fellow uh, that did these set of talks. He's not admitting that the Hafs is not part of that 10. You need to make sure that Muslims admit that. You need to make sure they go. Now, what they do, and what they say is that of these... Ten. Really, there are only five that are very popular today. Let's, and I've got all five of them here. So let's go through them. Uh, the most popular, of course, is Huffs. This one, ninety-five percent of the Muslim world uh, follows that. Then comes Warsh, which is this one right here. This is Warsh, and this one is very popular in Algeria, Morocco, parts of Tunisia, West Africa, and Sudan. Basically, North Africa. This is popular amongst three percent of the Muslim world. Okay, so three percent, ninety-five percent for Huffs. 3% for this one. The next one uh, that's most uh, is this one here, which is really the earliest one. This is the earliest one. This is Ibn Amir. Ibn Amir is very popular in parts of Yemen, and that's 1% of the Muslim world. So 1% for this guy. And he uh, wrote his in 736, over 100 years after Muhammad. So this is the earliest. This is the very beginning of all the Qira'ats, of all the different readings. So that's for 1%. Then you have 0.7% are Kalun. Kalun would be this guy right here. This is Kalun, and he died in 835. He died in the 9th century. 9th century, 835, about 100 years before he was chosen. Well, actually, he wasn't chosen by Ibn Mujahid. He was chosen by al Shatibi. Shatibi didn't choose him until the 12th century, 1194. Ooh, but anyways, 0.7% of the Muslim world follows his reading, and then you have al-Duri. Here's al-Duri. Al-Duri uh, is only really followed or memorized by uh, people from parts of Sudan and West Africa, again in Africa again. So those are the ones that are make up basically 100% of the Muslims today. Now, why then are these others sprinted? Well, there are people here and there, families here and there, that still memorize Ibn Kathir or Al Qasai or Khalaf or Shobab. And they're all 30 are being memorized by someone somewhere in the world. So you cannot throw them out or you don't want to throw them into the Nile anymore because there are still people who memorize them and they all are different. Um, our team in London has found 93,000 differences. 93,000 differences between these different Qira'at. But nonetheless, you need to know this. You need to be aware of the of the fact that there are that there are more than just one Quran uh, that has been memorized around the world. There are 30 of them. 
And the Huffs, this little guy here, is the most popular. And we'll get into that as to why he's a little popper. Now, one of the things that they'll want to do is they'll say, these differences are nothing more than dots and vowels. How many times have I said that? Have I not said that these differences are dots and vowels, dots and vowels? Five dots known as the it jam. The it jam would be the five dots. And then the harakat would be with the vowels, three vowels, the dhamma, the dhamma, which is the oo sound, little curly Q above the letter, the fata, which would be the a sound, just a slash above the letter. And then you have the kasra, which is the e sound below the letters. Dhamma, fata, katra, kasra. Two above, one below. Three vowels, five dots. That, those are what makes the difference. Now, this person that made hand this, uh, the, this whole talk, he goes on and he says that these variations among the kira tend to involve only the harakat, only the vowels. No, they do not. I'll, let me just give you some examples. And this is something I get a lot of Muslims just are, I don't know why they say that, because let me give you, here's some examples right here. I just went back, listen, we've put together about 70 of these examples. Uh, Hatun and I held them up actually at Speaker's Corner about four years ago, and then we did a whole session just looking at the differences. And, and you know, when we held them up, the Muslims try to grab them out of our hands and tear them. So we had to laminate them so you couldn't tear them. But that's the difficulty. They don't want to see this. They don't want you to know this. And that's because they haven't been told this. And even these people who are doing these talks think they know everything and they give me, all, and they just go on and on about how stupid I am. But stop, I'm just going to, since I am so, it's such an idiot from their standards, let's just look and see if these all include just vowelization. Here's one example here, Surah 2, Ayah 58. Take a look at this. Here's Surah 2, Ayah 58. And there you see on the left is the Huffs. The Hafs is the one that's known by or used by 95% of the world. Do you notice the word Nagfiru, which means shall forgive? And then look on the right and you see in the gold there or the orange, Warsh, that's the Warsh, that's the one that's used by uh, a, a good 3% uh, of, of the world, of people in all of North Africa, and that's Yugfaru. So Nagfaru is a Nun and Yugfaru is a Yao. Take a look, one dot above for Nag and two dots below. So those are dots. That's ijams. Those are not harakat. So there is, I've just disputed that. Let's take a look at another one. Here's another one here. And in this case, this is Surah 2, Ayah 140. Here's Surah 2, Ayah 140. And on the left is the takkuluna, which means you say. And you notice it is a ta, which is like a T, equivalent to our T. It has two dots above it. If you look at the little green slash there, uh, the warsh. If you notice, it's yakuluna, they say. So it's been changed from you say, second person singular, to they say, third person plural. And there's no vowelization difference there. That is a ijam, which means a dot. One, two dots are either above or two dots below. So what's this notion that this is only vowels? These aren't vowels at all. These are dots differences. I'm just giving you some examples. I could give you many, but I'm just doing this because I, I, I don't want to waste a lot of your time. Here's chapter 2, verse 219. On the left, you see kabirun, which is great. And you can see uh, the ba. There is the b. Look at the arrow pointing to the b there. Can you see it there with the uh, dot below? On the right side is the what? It's kathirun. Notice it has three dots above. Not one dot below, it has three dots above. There's the TH sound, which means plenty. So, is drinking wine and gambling a great sin? That is Kabirun, or, uh, or is it plenty of sin, which would be Kathirun? So it does change the meaning, and it also changes the context. So you can see these do change it, but this is not vowelization here. These are, absolutely, these actually are dots that change the meaning of the text. Here, I'm gonna, this is my last one I'm gonna put up there, because I just wanted to use some from Surah 2. I'm just going to one Surah, and I'm just looking at the house in the wash. I'm not looking at all the other 28. I'm just looking at these two, because these are the two most popular. One is 95% popular, that's the house on the left, and the other is only 3% popular, that's the wash on the right. So here's another one, Yuka Feru. You, that's with a Y, there's a two dots below there, can you see the arrows point to he, versus the wash, which is Nuka Feru, which is uh, one dot above, we. So, and he will remove or expate for you some of your misdeeds, or when we will remove. So, does Allah remove our misdeeds, or do we remove our own misdeeds? Can we, either this is Allah plural, or humans, or do what is reserved for Allah to do? So, therefore, you can see this could be a whole theological problem, it's just depending on where you put the dots. So, dots do also do the damage. Dots damage. Dots damage. And here's a case where dots do damage. 
dot do damage dummy and so can you understand why we're doing this and this is the difficulty why a lot of Muslims have not looked at these examples maybe we need to put more examples of them uh, listen Hutton and I did this four years ago and we can certainly bring them back again and uh, you can go and look at it yourself but that is a, a claim that is made that I think a lot of Muslims need to be careful of they're making claims that they do they cannot support let's move on to then number five here is a claim that it comes up, and I got this off of Wikipedia that was sent to me by somebody. He said, when Uthman made copies of the Quran, he did so according to one style, that's the harf, but he omitted the dots and the vowel points so that some other styles could also be accommodated. So talking about these dots and vowels, that Uthman omitted these dots and vowels. Now, there's two problems with that. First problem is, there were no dots and vowels at the time of Uthman. Dots and vowels had yet to be invented. All of these dots and vowels were, were created because of this problem, because if you don't have dots, you can have five different letters, five different dots, five different sets of dots, I'm sorry, and you can have five different letters, and for every word, there's three letters, so you can have up to 19 to 33 different meanings for one word, depending on where you put the dots and also where you put the vowels. So that would not make sense. We don't know of any reference anywhere where Uthman uh, did, not, uh, uh, did not, or sublimated, or took off the dots and vowels. No. What he did is he was eradicated anything that disagreed in the Razm, in the consonantal text. Uh, the Razm is the consonantal text. This is not something that you recite. This is not oral because then he burned those that disagree. You can't burn oral recitation. You only burn books. You earn, boy, how many times do I have to say this? And yet no Muslim has come back to me on this. So he burned these dialects, these dialectical differences. Oh boy, that, that caused all kinds of problems, but then can you see then the, the, this statement that is made here that he did this to accommodate it? No, he did not accommodate it. Why did he burn the others if he well, didn't want to accommodate it? He wanted only the Qureshi dialect, one dialect, one set of Razm, and then he sent that to five different cities. Uh, now, let's go back to another problem. This is, this, and this is the problem of the Al-Sabat, Sabat Ahruf. What do you do with this word, Al-Sabat Ahruf? The Sabat Afruf is something that has caused enormous amount of consternation. And even for the speaker who was speaking there in Africa, he didn't understand this. And he says it. He's very clear. Asuyuti enumerates 35 different interpretations. There exists a huge uncertainty regarding the term Sabat Afruf. Until now, no reasonable explanation has been offered for the exact meaning of the Sabat Afruf. And yet they're so concerned, yet they're so sure that there was a Sabat Afruf. Sabat Afruf means seven could be readings, seven words, could be harf, harf could be letter, harf could be word. I, I went up on the dictionary to look up what harf means because ahru means the plural of harf. And harf, I found 20 different, 20 different meanings or definitions for the word of. You can see then why no one wants to kind of take any position on this. Yasser Qadi does take a position on this. And he makes a difference, he makes a distinction uh, between the sabat ahruf and the kirat al sab. Now, the Sabat Ahruf means seven words, seven dialects. He says these are seven dialects. The Kirat al Sab, which is seven again, there's the word Sab, uh, Saba, uh, which is the word seven. Kirat would be the readings of seven. He said that these Kirat al Sab are the ones that were then introduced in the eighth century. So, with this guy, uh, with this guy first. You have Ibn, Ka, Ibn Amir. So this is the first. This is the first of them. 736, a whole hundred years after Muhammad. He has to make that distinction because he sees the problem. You cannot have the Sabat Ahru, which are the ones that Muhammad supposedly received from Gabriel, Jibril, before he died in 632. And you cannot confuse them with the Kirat al-Sab, the seven Kirat those seven that Ibn Mujahid chose in 936, you cannot have that in 632. That's 300 years too early. And you cannot have it in 736 because that's 100 years too early. Are you seeing why they're in a dilemma here and why no Muslim wants to take a position on it? So what do they say? It's a mystery. Huge uncertainty. Until now, no reasonable explanation has been offered. That's all they can say. And I'm saying, you know, then why are you so certain that there is a Quran? That it was only one Ahruf. One dialect. And how are you so certain that this was the Quraysh? Come back to that. Come back to that. So, I want to ask, number eight, what in is the Sabat Ahru? Help me here, since you guys can't understand it. Has this been on going on? You've had a thousand years to come up with a net definition. Yasser Khan, he had 25 years to do so, and he still couldn't do it. He didn't want to talk about it. He didn't want to talk about those things. He tried to say, take my class. Just take my class, and then I'll explain it. What's more... The Sabat Ahruf, where are they today? Where are these Sabat? Don't go show me these, because these are not the Sabat Ahruf. These are the Kirat al-Sab. 
These are the Kira'at. So there are seven Kira'ats. Those chosen by Ibn Mujahid. So don't use those. You can't use those anymore. You've got to show me where these Sabat Akhruf are. And you can see, I'm asking a question that nobody can answer. And yet Muslims are so sure that there's no problem here. There's no sure problem here. Then he says that these Kira'at, which were collected in Canada by Ibn Mujahid in 936, these, these uh, seven, not the, maybe the seven were, but not the ten. And then he goes on and says, only the ignorant masses took the Sabat Afruf of the prophetic tradition to be the seven canonical readings. Well, no, I would suggest that almost every Muslim I've met has confused this. So be careful. Uh, I don't know if, you're, if this person is quoting Shadi Nasser or is he quoting himself. But listen, these are not ignorant. Even Muslims cannot. I have yet to find a Muslim that can really define what the Al-Sabat Afruf. What are they? Where are they? Who introduced them? Who had them? Did Uthman have them? Did Muhammad have them? Did Jibril give them to him? Because I thought Jibril, according to Al-Buhari and also Muwatta al-Imam Malik. Now, interesting. When you ask, talk about this, you need to go to the Muwatta of, of, of Malik. The Muwatta of Malik, which, which was written in 796. Take a look at the date. Again, 796. I'm going to keep reminding you. 796 is the late 8th century. This comes after this. Remember, this was written. Where are we here? Here we go. This is the first of the Kirats. So when you talk about the Muwatta of Ibn Malik, you're talking about a good 60 years later. 796 is 60 years after 736. Are you following that? So the late 8th century was where you first get reference to this Sab Al Sabat Akhruf. These seven readings, these seven words, these seven dialects, whatever you want to call it, those were introduced by Muwatta. Ibn Malik in the late 8th century. They did not exist in the 7th century at all. Al-Buhari also refers to them. That's 870. Okay, 870 or that's the late 9th century. But which ones are they referring to? And this is why I love it. it in some ways, I like to play the Mickey on them. Because if you're looking at Muwatta as the earliest that these are introduced, that's 63, 60 years after Ibn Amir. And it's 163 years after Muhammad. So this whole idea of the seven readings was introduced 163 years after Muhammad. No wonder they don't know what they're talking about. No wonder everybody's confused. No wonder that there are 35 different interpretations by LCUT alone. He didn't know what to do with it. He had 35 different ways of trying to explain it. Can you see then why Muslims are in a real dilemma today? And in order to know what the ahruf are, you have to go to the word harf. Harf. Take a look in the dictionary. Go, any of you, go to the dictionary and write in harf defined and look and see how many different definitions. I found 20 different definitions of the word harf and that is the problem. So nobody knows what they're talking about because there's no way you can know it because you don't know sure which one of these definitions you're going to use. And that's what I would suggest is the problem. They want to, and they're thinking that these kira'ats must be it. I've heard so many Muslims do that, but now you need to say, no, these kira'ats have nothing to do with those seven. Those are the seven kira'ats that Ibn Mujahid chose in 936. And that's why over and over again, you get these, this confusion. What do we, the Muslims mean by kira'at in Aruf? Here's my 12th problem. Kira'at are sometimes confused with Ahruf, both being variants of the Quran. Variants of the Quran. This is what this teacher is saying. Variants, so he is admitting that there are variants in the Quran. Great. God, they, they, I'm glad he's now come alongside Joseph Qadi and also uh, Shabir Ali. They now agree that there are variants of the Quran. At least he's made it that. They're in Africa. They've now admitted it. And that they have seven different varieties. However, this varieties of Ahruf were continued by order of Caliph Uthman. This, and then I said, wait a minute. Is, did he really, is that a typo? The varieties of the Ahruf were continued by the order of Caliph Uthman sometime in the mid-7th century when the Quran began to be read in seven harf, in seven variations. So now you're saying that there are, this is uh, the authority of Uthman. Where in the world did this person get this idea that Uthman authorized seven different readings? If you look at Al-Buhari, volume 6, hadith number 509 and 510, book 64, if you take a look and see, what, and this is the best tradition of how the Quran is put together. This is what every Muslim, this is the standard narrative of what every Muslim must follow. When you look and see what Al-Buhari is saying, when Hudayfa comes down from Azerbaijan because of the fact he hears different di dialects and he goes into the mosque and they go to fisticuffs about it, Hudayfa comes back down to Medina and confronts Uthman, the caliph in 650, 652, and says, we cannot have so many different Qurans like the Christians and Jews have different Bibles. We must have just one Quran. 
we must have one Quran. So they could, took Zayd ibn Tabi to then rewrite the Quran in the Qurayshi dialect so there would be no more derivations. There would be no more dialects. There would be no more of these, what we know is Ahrus, these Sabat Ahruf. So what is in this world is this guy saying that the Uthman <laughs> that varieties of Ahruf are continued by order of that he authorized these seven readings and that the Quran began to be read in seven harf. I, 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 where is he going for this? The, I have never heard any Muslim make, say this kind of thing. And I'd love to know if any Muslim would support this. Because what you're saying is, throw out al-Bukhari then. Because it's very clear that as of 652, all of the, any, all the other ones that disagreed with the Qureshi dialect were then burnt. They were destroyed. And that's in black and white. And here's the picture. I'm going to put it up there. Here's the picture. Take a look. There it is right there. You can read it in the Arabic. You can read it in the English. It's there for you to look at. So this idea that he did that is completely off the wall and goes against everything that, every, that Muslims should be following. The seven readings of the Kirat were noted by Abu Bakr ibn Mujahid and canonized in the 8th century. Oh, dear, 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 dear. Uh, I, don't know who, I don't know why this person thinks he's a scholar. When you say that they, that they were canonized, so now he's contradicting about Uthman. Now he's going to that these were canonized. Okay, so he was canonized by ibn Mujahid. Yes, the seven were canonized. But in the 8th century? I mean, does he even looking at when? I mean, he, when did Ibn Mujahid die? 936. Is that the 8th century? No, that's the 10th century. That's 200 years later. How many times do I have to keep reminding Muslims? Would you look in a timeline and get these dates correct? And please, if you are an authority on the Qirat, then get your dates correct on it. For heaven's sakes, he did not live in the 8th century. He did not canonize this in the 8th century. These are from the 8th century, yes. Ibn Amir is from the 8th century. Khalaf is from the 8th century. Yes, uh, in fact, there's quite a few. All of these are from the 8th century. Nafi, Ibn Kathir, Ibn Amir, Ibn Amr, Asim, Hamza, al kisai but not Ibn Mujahid, the one who canonized him, the one that chose him. He is from the 10th century. That's 200 years too late. But that's not all. He didn't, it wasn't the only one. That, he just caught, canonized the first seven. And then in uh, then you have ten, and that's canonized in fourteen twenty nine. <laughs> that's the fifteenth century. So those first ten are not canonized until the fifteenth century, and they do not include house. We're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. But it just gets more and more. I, I have to laugh sometimes when I hear some of the statements that are put out by these Muslims who consider themselves to be authorities in this subject. I'm not an authority in this subject, and I can find error after error, fault after fault. I don't claim to be an authority. I'm just reading what I see. Yeah, uh, Shadi Nasr is saying, I'm reading the same thing that they are reading, and I cannot understand why they're not picking up on these dates and they're not picking up on what they're saying. They're making error after error. Then he goes on and he talks about, this person talks about the irregular readings. These are the Shawad, or Shawad, it depends on how you want to pronounce it. And they said that, that the readings have to agree. In order to find what was, rec what was canonical and what was irregular, Shawad means irregular readings, the ones were thrown out, discarded. That's why Ibn Mujahid threw them out. Remember, there are hundreds that he threw out. He only retained seven, Ibn Mujahid. And then Shatabi then re added another 14 because of two. And he did that in a poem that he put together there in 1194. And then you have al Jazari, Zari, who or Jazari, or however you want to put it. Some people say Jazari, some people say Jazari. He then added the other three plus the six that follow them, uh, the riwayats, the, the reciters, and the, I'm sorry, the transmitters, and those then make it a 30 of them by the 15th century. So how did they choose those 30, and why didn't they choose the others? Well, they, the others were no the Shawad. Those were then irregular. How did they know how they come to which were regular and which were not irregular? Well, the, according to this scholar from Africa, he says the reading has to agree with the consonant Uthmanic recension. Oy, 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 oy. Now you, you know you hear Muslims throw this out all the time. They had to agree with the consonal Uthmanic rizm. Rizm means consonal text. So now suddenly they're saying the reason why they were chosen had to do with rizm. No, they did not, because the differences between them have nothing to do with rizm. The differences between these 30 are all to do with dots and vowels. Dots and vowels, dots and vowels. I can make it into a song. I could just do a poem on it. Please, can you hear me? Would you, I don't know how many times I've said this. This has nothing to do with the rhythm. If you want to talk about rhythm, you need to talk about this. Then you need to get back to Dan Brubaker's. We haven't even got into this material. That is the much more damaging. 
So be careful because there is no razam for them to have looked at. None of these were compared to the razam because we don't even know if these razam match this, the earliest razam, because no one's even looked at the earliest manuscripts to know whether those razam are all uniform. No one has done that. Why? For one very good reason. There is no Uthmanic consonantal text. 114 surahs from the time of 652. You cannot find it. It does not exist. And as much as Muslims keep saying this, just like it's almost like a mantra, that's like Yasar Qadi's mantra. They just say it over and over again. They're not thinking how stupid it sounds. And we're not going to take it anymore. We're not that dumb. People keep on thinking that, you know, that this, listen, you could get it, you could have gotten away with that prior to this year. That's true. In 2020, most people didn't know what you were talking about. But you can't get away with that anymore after 2020. No, because we are now getting it up on the internet. And, we are, and we're saying over and over again, there is no consonantal manuscript of the entire Quran, a whole 114 surahs from the time of Uthman that we can see today. I, and, and, you, and, and listen, no Muslim can show me a complete consonantal text. So how could they have used this to know what was, what was, was shawad or not? How did you know which is irregular or not? There is no Rasm to talk about. And we're not talking about Rasm. Because none of these have to do with Rasm. They all have to do with five dots and three vowels. Five dots and three vowels. All of which were invented in the 8th and 9th century. None of this existed at the time of Uthman, who lived in the mid-7th century. Are you following this? I hope this... Listen, I get tired of always repeating myself, and I sound like a broken record. Uh, but that I've got to come out and guess what say. So, I would love to know... Who has done any work? Uh, from this scholar who supposedly claims to be a scholar in Africa, I would love to know who carried out this, this work that has done on all 30. Show me anybody that has looked at all 30 of all the 30 rewai, uh, the, the 30 kirats, and has done a work to show where the razam exactly the same is exactly the same as from Uthman. Can you see why I'm saying this? I'm doing this tongue in cheek. Because there is no Uthmanic. Razum to begin with, and secondly, I don't know of any work that's done it. Nobody looks at that. Nobody has even cracked these books to even look and see how they're different until we did it, until the team in London did it, until the team in Australia did it. It's those two teams that have come up and just shocked the whole world. When they looked at just 23 of them in London, they came up with 93,000 differences. And nobody didn't seem to know this, and they've had a thousand years to do this, and we've just all done this in the last four years. It's now been done as I speak. And just looking at these two right here, just these two right here, the team in Australia has come up with 5,000 differences between dots and vowels. No one's looking at the razum yet. No one's looking at the razum yet. That has yet to be done because we want to look at the razum, not of these, because these are nothing more than dots and vowels. We want to look at the razum, but that has yet to be done. So don't make this app crease, this crazy statement that that's how they came to know which one were these. They didn't even open the book. They didn't even look at any of the text. They chose these kirats. They did not choose them by their text. They chose them by popularity. The canonization that was done, the reason why Ibn Mujahid chose them was by who had the most students. Who was the most popular? Which lines, how many lines they had from their names that followed how many students they had, how many different readers they had, uh, I'm sorry, transmitters they had below them. It had to do with popularity, nothing to do with the script. Uh, so, Hafs has, has a sound transmission in the consensus of the Quran reciters in mass. So that's why they chose the Hafs. Uh, where was, and I would like to ask him, where was the consensus in Mass for the Hafs in 1924? Where was this consensus of the Mass? How, how, uh, one man with a one committee in Al Azhar, there in Cairo, in 1924, chose Hafs. And this was decided all over the world in Mass? No, it took them up till 1985 to finally make it all over the world and make it the authority. But even today, you can still see they still exist. Why are they still here? If there has been a decision that the Hafs is the text, what happened? What about the Warsh? In the three percent of the Muslim world still uses the Warsh in North Africa. So you can see this has not been a canonical text that has now been signed. Now let's get to Hafs because since we got into Hafs, I think I'd like to bring out a lot of things about Hafs. Hafs. 
is this guy right here. This is the guy Hafs who died in the 796. So he is the late 8th century. According to the, what the scholar in Africa is saying is the Mus'haf of the Quran that is in general use throughout the, almost all of the Muslim world today is a 1924 Egyptian edition based on the Qira'at reading of the Hafs on the authority of Asim. Asim, yes, Asim would be the reader. Asim was from Kufa, so was Hafs from Kufa. Uh, uh, Asim died in 745. Hafs died in 796. You notice he therefore is in the stable of Asim, both from Kufa, both from Iraq, both from the place well, I'm going to get to that. Uh, they, they shouldn't have been from. <laughs> you can see why as I get to it. Now, my first question. Hafs being the Rawi of the transmitter of Asim awesome being the Kira of the reader. Okay, that, so far that's good. But here's my question. If it is the most authoritative, if Hafs is the most authoritative Kira reading of the Quran, 95% of the Muslim world now has accepted that because Muhammad Ibn Ali al Husayni al Haddad chose it in 1924. Then they had some changes. Then it was chosen for all of Egypt in 1936, called the Farouk edition. And then it was finally chosen by, for the whole world by King Fahd in uh, Saudi Arabia in 1985, 35 years ago. If this was the authoritative uh, Qur'an reading of the Qur'an, why is it it's not one of the seven? Why is it it's not one of the ten? Ooh, doo -doo -doo. No Muslim has answered me on that. And I want to see if any of the Muslims listening can answer me. If this is the one that is chosen for the whole world today, and 95% of, of the Muslim world now read it, and sorry, memorize it, and read it, then why is it not part of the seven that was chosen by Ibn Mujahid in 936, of which they were derived from 736 up until 805? 936 is when he chose those seven. The other three that come after that were chosen by Al-Jazari, which was in 1429. Uh, 15th century, still Hafs is not part of those 7 plus 3, 10. The creme de la creme, the best of the best, Hafs is not a part of those 10. Bingo, you've got a problem here. Come on, Muslims, answer me on this. And don't shy away and don't run away. The reason why is very clear. When you look at Hafs, the reason he was not chosen is because he was I'm going to quote now, quote after quote. There are so many quotes about him from the Islamic traditions, the traditions from the 9th and 10th century. And they say that he is unreliable, that he is weak, that he was untrustworthy. He contained objectionable material. He had fabricated chains. That's Isnads. He was a liar. And thus his transmissions were not recorded by others and others avoided him. That is the reason he was not chosen by anybody before. So why in the world did Muhammad al Ibn al Husayni al Adad choose him? And why in the world are Muslims choosing him today? Why are Muslims still choosing Hafs today? If he was that inept that even his peers living at his time rejected him in the 8th century, the late 8th century, then why in the world are you choosing him today? This person says it uses, if there's no reason why Hafs was chosen, because they're using a set of additional, because he, the, the Hafs, uses a set of additional symbols and an elaborate system of modified vowel signs and for, the min and for minute details not identical to an older system. So that's why he was chosen. Well, isn't that rather odd that you would use something that has additional symbols? What additional symbols and modified vowel signs? So in other words, he is completely different than awesome. Is that what you're telling me? Very different from those in his own stable? Awesome from Kufa? Is that what you're taking me? Then why in the world would he be chosen if he's using completely different, completely different symbols and also modified vowel signs? Let's move on. Most damaging, he's from the wrong city. That has not been answered yet. He is from Kufa, which is not part of the Hijaz, which is not part of Mecca and Medina, which is not where Uthman created the canonical text. Remember, he had Zaid ibn Thabit write to him, write him a Qureshi dialect, a Qureshi dialect, and he burned all the others. Kufa was one of those that was burned. It was those people in Kufa that were up there in Azerbaijan that were fighting alongside the Medinans when they came to blows because they had a different Quran. <laughs> so this doesn't make sense that they would then choose the very redition that comes from the city that had been destroyed by Uthman in 652. Why would they choose it in 1924? The reason is very simple. They chose it in 1924 because the Ottomans chose it. The Ottomans who came to power in 1299, so they came to power in the late 13th century, chose something that they loved between the 13th century and the time that they were finally thrown out in 1924. They were chosen, it was chosen because they chose it, and they chose it because it was 
easy to read and because it was close to where they came from. We're guessing. We're guessing on that one. I would love to know why the Ottomans chose them. But can you see this again had to do with popularity? It's whichever one is the most popular, not which one has the best text, not which one goes back to the original text because there is no original text for them to go back to. No wonder they didn't open the pages. No wonder they didn't read the words. No wonder they didn't read the letters. No wonder they're making the claims today that they can't support over and over and over again. I'm almost done, but can you see why I'm having to laugh? Because some of the things, the claims that these guys make, they just are off the wall. Now, we, thought, we know that the 1924 Huff's edition, according to this gentleman, uh, that it was first chosen by Muhammad ibn al husseini al-Haddad, and then that it was then made Egypt-wide, and he says by F Fuad, no, 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 not in Egypt, by Fuad, Farouk. Look at the dates. Again, another, there's, I mean, this guy is just full of errors. Patronage of Fuad of Egypt is the one why they chose it for Egypt. No, they didn't. That was only for the city of Cairo. That was only for the high schools there in Cairo. How do I know that? Well, I use this book right here, and you can all use it. Uh, you just need to read the story. It's right here in the Quran in its historical context, and by Gabriel said Reynolds. This has been out uh, since 2008, I think. I think I'm right there, 2008. Yeah, this has been out for 12 years, folks. There's no reason why you can't read this book. Get it. Read it. Look on page two and three. He goes right through all this thing of how it was chosen and where they chose it and why is that when they even chose it in, in 1924, they then had to make correction after correction. In fact, according to him, there were f four different lines of transmissions that's known as Turuk of Huffs himself. So there's at least four different Huffs. There's not just one. There's many different lines of Huffs. In fact, I understand that our, my good friend, my good, uh, my good friend, um, Hatun Tash, my good friend Hatun Tash has been able to collect seven of them. So, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, there's quite a few of these huffs. And the reason why is they because they kept on being changed. And so, there was one in the late part, in the beginning part of June when they first chose it. When he first chose it, then it had to be revised. So, the end of June, they, I'm sorry, the end of 1924, they come out with a new revised edition. And then they came out with another new revised edition of huffs in 1936. There, there were changes after changes of the huffs. So, the one that was finally chosen for all of Egypt was known as the Farouk edition uh, the, because of King Farouk, um, who came to power in 1936. I'm sorry, was there in power in 1936. Uh, they for they had to then, they chose, they call it that. That was for all of Egypt. That was so successful, according to Gabriel said Reynolds on page two of his book, uh, that it was then chosen much later by, in 1985, by King Fahd there in Saudi Arabia for the whole world. So let's conclude. And this is the conclusion. I'm going to read you this character's conclusion. Listen to this conclusion. This is how he's going to end his whole talk. The whole talk. This is how he ends it. Listen to this. The readings of the Quran derive their legitimacy from the prophetic tradition of the Saba Ahruf. However, Muslim scholars have had no common understanding of the meaning of the term Harf. The mystery of the Saba Ahruf, the seven readings, seven words, seven whatever, has resulted in more than 35 different interpretations of this tradition. Nonetheless, despite the vagueness of the concept of harf, the discipline of Qirat, and the meticulous transmission of the variant readings of the Quran were heavily dependent on the mysterious Sabat Ahruf tradition. That's his conclusions. That's his conclusion. My goodness. Let's just read that again. This is what it comes out to. The Qira'ats of the Quran get their authority from the Sabat Ahruf, which, because no one understands it, has created 35 different conclusions about it. Nonetheless, let's not worry, since the entire Qira'at discipline is heavily dependent on this mysterious Sabat Ahruf, which no one understands. And that's where he leaves you. Can you then understand why no one wants to engage us with this? They don't want to engage us because they don't even know what they're talking about. They have no idea why these were chosen. They cannot have no idea why these were chosen because even when Ibn Mujahid, when he chose the first seven of the 30 that were then chosen by the 15th century, he had to do something because there was such a proliferation of so many different Qurans with many different derivations, with so many contradictory types of, uh, of dialectical and, yes, you should say pronunciation, and yes, Yes, many different ways of saying the same thing. And so that's why he had to choose the first seven. Then, of course, uh, our good friend um, uh, al Shatabi then chose another 14. And then, of course, our good friend Al-Jazari chose uh, another nine, making 30. So <laughs> this whole thing with trying to make a sense of this, uh, of these, this, this reference to... Uh, this whole thing of trying to make this reference to Sabat Ahruf. And don't confuse it with the Kira'at Sabat. 
both seven, and that's why they're both seven, there's the confusion. Since it's so confusing to them, they conclude it's just mystery. We just know it exists, and we know that the Quran is one. We know the Quran is one. And so when you have Muhammad Hijab finally, after 25 minutes, putting his hand out there, says, which one of these are you going to write here? Which one are you going to write in my hand? There should be only one Quran. That's what we've been told. Not one word, not one letter. There should be only one of these. We've been told us to be knee high to the gospel, and that's what you all tell us. That's what you've driven into us. We've all believed that, and we have come to Islam because of that. And now I want you to tell me, which one of those 30, please? Tell me, which one of those 30, after 25 minutes, what did Yasser Qadi say? They are all the Quran. All 30 of them. You just mix them up. Fill a little bit of this. Yeah, get some huffs here. Let's, let's get some water here. Why don't we get some Kasai here? Even got Ami. Oh yeah, why don't you just put them all together? Just mix them up. Mix them up. And what you get to come with you is the Quran. All 93,000 differences is the Quran. All 93,000 differences is the Quran. My gosh, I'm so glad I don't have this problem with the Bible. I'm so glad we don't have this claim. I'm so glad we don't say the same thing. I'm so glad when we talk about this book, we don't talk about an uncreated book. We don't talk about a book that exists on eternal tablets in heaven. We don't talk about a book that has been sent down to just one man. We talk about 30 different, over 30 different authors over a period from 1400 BC all the way up to the first century AD. 1400 years of inspired writing by God, written, inspiring the writers, every one of them. That's why there's four different gospels, four different accounts of Jesus' ministry, of what he said and did the last three years of his life, four different ones. They don't contradict each other. They all agree of who this man Jesus was, what he did and what he said. And we can trust it. Not because we say these have our internal tablets that not one word or letter has changed. We know where the changes are. We are very transparent about it. We never make these claims. Therefore, we don't have to defend them. And there's no mystery in this. There's no mystery of the what seven are we talking about? Are we talking about the seven that Gabriel gave? Are we talking about the seven that Uthman uh, gave author authority? Or are we talking about the seven that even Mujahid finally did? There are seven here, seven there, seven all over the place. <laughs> There's so many sevens, they don't know. Why. They're running after sevens. Can you then understand? Thank God the Bible. We can love it, we can read it, we can apply it. It is as relevant today as the day it was written down. That's why I love the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's why we're going to end this segment with this book. This book doesn't have these problems. And I can sit there and I can be not only give, give it to you, but ask you to open it because it is just full of reference after reference pointing to Jesus Christ, pointing to what he did, pointing to what he said. What a man for today. What a book for today. I give you the Bible. God bless you. This is Jay. Over and out. <laughs>